From Washington, D.C., this is Middle East Focus. Welcome to Middle East Focus. I'm Alistair Taylor, MEI's Editorial Director. Today we're going to be talking about Iran. This month marks the 40th anniversary of the 1979 revolution, the fall of the monarchy, the rise of Ayatollah Khomeini, and the establishment of the Islamic Republic. We'll be discussing where things stand four decades on, how the revolution affected U.S.-Iranian relations, its impact on the region, and where things might go from here. I'm joined today by three excellent guests, Ahmed Majidyar, Alex Vatanka, and John Limber. Ahmed is a senior fellow at MEI and the director of our Iran Observe program. Alex is also a senior fellow here at MEI and an Iran specialist. John is a retired professor of Middle Eastern Studies at the U.S. Naval Academy, a foreign service officer for 34 years. He was the deputy secretary of state for Iran under the Obama administration, and he was also among the 52 Americans held hostage during the Iran hostage crisis. Ahmed, Alex, John, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Pleasure. John, let's start with you. Looking back from the perspective of 2019, four decades later, how do you view the revolution? Alistair, my interaction with Iran goes back over 50 years. I mean, I've been there as a, a tourist, a student, a professor, a diplomat, a researcher, a prisoner. Um, and anyone who claims that he predicted the revolution uh, is wrong. Simply not true. The other part was, at the time, who knew in what direction it was going to go. It took a very, what can I say, negative direction. There was a burst of hope. I mean, Iranians have been, for over 100 years, since the early 20th century, have been in this long, long-term struggle to establish independence, dignity, and to sort of recover their national self-respect. This struggle goes on. The revolution was part of it. But like some of the earlier struggles, the constitutional period, the oil nationalization period, it, it went seriously, seriously bad. A friend of mine wrote to me uh, a, a while back, and he put it this way. He's used a Persian proverb. It says, sal basal derich has parsal, meaning every year we look back at last year and we say, we had it good then. Alex, in the protests leading up to the revolution, Iranians voiced demands for things like reform, social justice, economic opportunity, fight against corruption. On that front, how much progress has been made over the past four decades? You know, Alistair, let me just start off by saying I was only four years old when the revolution happened, but I was a resident in Tehran. And even as a four-year-old, I do remember vividly that this was a popular revolution. This wasn't just a small group of people sort of showing up and wanting to change. This was Arguably, some academics have estimated 10 percent of the country was behind actively uh, the sort of anti-Shah movement. Now, compared to the French or the Russian revolutions of before, this was a significant percentage. But that 10 percent of the old people who came out and wanted the Shah gone had a very poor idea about what they wanted instead. And that's where they got it wrong. So they did know that there were things about the Shah's lifestyle they didn't like. There were things about corruption and so forth they didn't like. But these were all vague concepts in people's minds. And for, don't, don't forget this. We, we still, in this country, the United States referred to it as, as the Islamic Revolution, which I think is a mistake. It was the Iranian Revolution of 1979. Vast majority of people, you could argue the bulk of the revolutionary movement was leftist, was communist, was not Islamist. What the Islamists do is by 1981, they overtake everybody else. They become the masters of the revolution simply through the use of force, intimidation. They were the ones with the biggest stick around, if you will. So by the time the first president of the Islamic Republic flees back to France, uh, Bani Saad in 1981, the Islamists have consolidated. And you can look at what has happened in Iran since 1981, and you can make the case that all the promises of 79 have more or less been left unfulfilled. Corruption today is worse than my parents' generation. Disparity in terms of wealth is worse than anybody can ever remember, and so on and so forth. And, and fundamentally, the point I, I make is this. There's probably nothing as big as what I'm about to tell you, which is the disconnect between the ruling class and their people. The Shah might have had an issue, but I can tell you, I told Ali, Ali Khamenei and his people today, that the distance between him and his class at the top of the pyramid of power and the people has never been as great as it is today. I mean, taking a step back and looking at the kind of big picture, how important was the revolution in shaping the broader modern Middle East? Well, the Islamic revolution in Iran was 
perhaps the most consequential event in the modern history of the Middle Eastern politics. And it continues to play a key role in shaping geopolitical issues in the region. One thing that the Islamic Revolution increased the role of Islam in modern Middle Eastern politics. And much of the sectarianism that we see across the region today, that did back to the 79 revolution. Because when Ayatollah Khomeini came in power, he openly called for export of the revolution abroad. And uh, the regime started to fund and support revolutionaries and extremist groups from Pakistan to Iraq and the Levant region and beyond. And many of these regional countries saw the revolution and the new regime in Tehran as an existential threat. And as a result, for example, we saw Saudi Arabia, that it increased its support for extremist group and fundamentalist Sunni groups across the region, which created this kind of vicious cycle between the two leading Middle Eastern powers that continues to destabilize the region today. I would argue that Iranian foreign policy has become less revolutionary, and today's Iran's power politics in the region is more a combination of real politics, its use of proxy elements as a deterrence strategy against its perceived threats. But ideology still uh, plays a part, and Iran continues to use sub-state and uh, non-state actors as an instrument of policy to pursue its interests. John, I wanted to ask you specifically about the issue of uh, Iranian-U.S. relations. Uh, Iran went from being one of the closest U.S. allies in the central part of its Middle East policy under the Twin Pillars strategy to one of its fiercest rivals and a member of the Axis of Resistance. What role did the hostage crisis play in that? And do you think it was inevitable or things could things have gone differently? Historians love questions like that. I, I, I'm trained as a historian. I, I worked with a lot of political scientists. When you're a historian, you ask questions, just tell me what happened and I'll tell you why. And that's where we are. No, this the century-long struggle of Iranians to become masters in their own house. U.S. was originally on the right side of that. We supported the Iranians during the constitutional period. We supported them after World War II when there was a movement backed by the Soviet Union that threatened to partition the country. At the beginning of the oil nationalization crisis, the Americans and uh, President Truman were very sympathetic to the nationalist cause. And it was a combination of Cold War rhetoric, anti-communist hysteria, and frankly, short-sightedness that created a very unhealthy relationship with the Pahlavi monarchy and with its excess to the point that President Carter very famously in the end of 1977, goes to Tehran and refers to Iran as this island of stability in a turbulent region. Almost a year to the day after he made that speech, Iran was in chaos and the Shah was gone. Now, fine, but almost anyone who looked at Iran in, let's say, late 1977 would have said the same thing. It looked good. The country was prosperous, it was developing, it was moving, it had very few foreign enemies, relations with the U.S. were good, but there was this failure to look beneath the surface. Either we did not see the resentment that lay below the surface, or we didn't want to see it. We've had 40 years of estrangement. What was the role of the hostage? I think it was central. It remains a festering sore for many people. Americans who were not even alive at the time don't remember it. But it's still out there. And from time to time, it's trotted out. The Iranians have not helped their cause by pretending that, in fact, that this was a good thing and by commemorating it uh, every year and by refusing to admit that what they did was disgraceful, was shameful, and was in violation of all their best traditions of both uh, national traditions and religious traditions. Alex, in a similar vein, you wrote a really interesting piece in foreign policy at the end of last year on the kind of missed opportunities in the early days after the revolution, before the idea of working with the U.S. became taboo. Could you maybe tell us a little bit about that? You know, my starting point is, to be honest, to this day, 40 years later, we don't know if the head of the revolution in 1979, Ayatollah Khomeini, knew beforehand that they're going to take over the embassy. And there's still some debate about it. Certainly, two leading figures of the revolution since— this current Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei and 
his partner stroke rival uh, Akbar Rafsanjani who passed away in 2017 they weren't even in Tehran when it happened they were in Saudi Arabian pilgrimage so well, I wrote that piece thinking if they weren't even on the ground it tells me this was much more ad hoc random if anything or you could argue that the so-called Islamic left the ones that were most anti-American, had leftist tendencies, that they were really behind it. All that's put aside. And to going back to what John talked about, this didn't serve Iran's interests. This incident has never served Iranian national interest. It has served the interest of one political faction within the Islamic Republic, that being the camp around Khomeini, who basically, the best argument one could make for it is wanted to take away something that was very dear to the left and make it their own, which was anti-Americanism. By taking over the U.S. embassy, they took away a prized, you know, issue that the left uh, found to be so close to their heart. And so it was all tactical, political calculations based on what they wanted to see happen domestically and consolidate power. Now, 40 years on, and you think about the costs the cost for the Iranian people in terms of lost opportunities and everything else that's come with it, it's, it's quite staggering. I think early on, if you listen to someone like Rafsanjani, who was a senior member of the Iranian regime for as long as um, he was alive, as soon as he became president, right after Khomeini died, he started hinting by saying this was a mistake. And soon enough, he publicly admitted this was a mistake. This was a mistake. We shouldn't have done it. And he would later on say slogans like death to America are not very productive. They're not helping our case. So I think what I'm trying to get to, Alastair, is the following. Within the regime, there is broad recognition that this hostility against the United States has not been good for Iran or even the regime, even the regime. This notion that Russia or China or somebody else on the global scale is going to come and save Iran from the bad United States is nothing but an illusion in their minds. It just has nothing to do with the reality. But again, as something John said, not only was it disgraceful, another thing they haven't done is to admit their mistake. And this is part and parcel of the DNA of this regime. They don't want to admit to mistakes. They imposed the veil on women early on. All the data shows is unpopular. If you could ask people, do you want mandatory veil in Iran? People say no. But for them, concessions or accepting that something they did was wrong is tantamount to concession. And once you start conceding here and there, then they might lose their grip on power. And that's what they fear the most. John, I wanted to ask you about when you could have touched on this earlier. What do you think the main lesson of the revolution is for U.S. foreign policy? Is it kind of be prepared for the black swan event? Is it don't put all your eggs in one basket? Or what's your view on that? You know, again, be prepared to be wrong. If you deal with Iran particularly, but in, in most areas of foreign policy, they say in this town here in Washington, you if you're going to be an Iran expert, you have to be able to say two things. One is, I don't know. And the second is, it's very complicated. Those will answer 99% of the question. One is, have a little bit of intellectual humility. I've been wrong about Iran a lot. I did not expect that we would still be estranged after 40 years. I thought wiser heads would prevail. And they almost did a few years ago before some bad luck happened. The other part is, question the conventional wisdom. Look deeper. Ask questions. Jimmy Carter, whom I respect a great deal, when he admitted the Shah to Iran, he gave the extremists in Iran uh, the perfect excuse to cement their power and to crush all rivals with a more open and liberal vision of where the Islamic Republic should go. Was he aware, for example, of the ghosts of 1953 that were lurking in the room when he told the Iranians, we have no political motive for admitting the Shah. This is purely humanitarian. Was there someone in the room? I used to tell my students at the Naval Academy, I said, when you're in that room, you have to speak up and say, sir, if you tell that to the Iranians, no one over the age of three is going to believe you. Fast forwarding to the present, Ahmed, I'm curious, how is the revolution perceived popularly within Iran today? So the Islamic Revolution promised uh, the Iranians freedom, dignity, and economic prosperity. But 40 years on, we see that the legacy of the revolution has been repression, isolation, and social 
economic deprivation. I would argue that uh, the Iran-Iraq war in the 1980s helped the regime to consolidate its power. As Alex mentioned, the revolution was by a broad coalition of very different groups uh, with very diverse demands and voices, but the clerics, they sidelined them, and their voices and demands were not incorporated in the constitution, in the political structure. So invaded by a foreign country, Ayatollah Khomeini used the revolutionary fervor and Iranian's nationalist sentiments to rally people around the flag and consolidate its power. But today, the situation, I think, is very different. About 70 percent of the Iranian population, they are under the age of 35. So they were not born at the time of the revolution. They don't feel that kind of strong connection with the revolution. They don't have much memory of even the 1980s war. They have different expectations about better opportunities, about freedom about their ability to shape their future themselves. They are better connected with the outside world. So as a result, we see that on the 40th anniversary of the revolution, we see sporadic protests against the regime in different parts of the country. And particularly, some of these protests are happening in conservative rural areas that traditionally they have been the strong base for the regime. So that is challenging. But having said that, the Iranians are also very cautious about kind of bringing change inside Iran. They saw what happened after the revolution. They saw what happened after the Arab Spring across the region. So although they want change, they don't want an armed uprising or another revolution to topple the regime, and particularly the middle class and the reformists even in Iran, they do want change, but they fear that if they come to the streets and that protest movement become a national movement to topple the regime, the problem could be that the Revolutionary Guard, for example, used that opportunity to further securitize and militarize the society, or Iran just descend into chaos and instability, for example, in Syria. Alex, in terms of the issues that, that Ahmed was just speaking about, it seems like Iran's facing a, a real crisis on a variety of fronts, from the political and the economic to, to the social. Do you think this is a, a tipping point, and do you think it's fair to draw a parallel with the situation in the run-up to the revolution? Oh, those people who... Uh to something that John mentioned before, you know, I've been predicting the moment of the tipping point. I think you know, we've heard that for, for, for a long time. Ask anyone in the Iranian diaspora and they'll tell you they were supposed to go home long, long time ago because the regime would have by now have toppled. So no, the regime has been far stronger in terms of its ability to stay in power than most Iranians would have predicted back in 1979. But to something that what Ahmed said, which I think is very true, you know, you have a sense right now inside I Iran and among the Iranian diaspora that something really dangerous is around the corner. And that something dangerous is the dismantlement of Iran, the disintegrated fragmentation of Iran, if you will. Now, I tend to think that is not going to happen anytime soon. But if the regime in Tehran stays the course, it will become a factor one has to fear. Because when you have a central government in Tehran that's not just apart from the mainstream folks in the Persian-speaking heartland of Iran, but even I can deliver basic services to the more sort of uh, marginal communities on the borderlands, the Kurds, the Baluch, and so on. The issue of secessionism becomes one that we have to fear again. It's not a new thing. It's been going on, as, as you heard before, since the 40s when the Soviets were trying to sort of incite some ethnic groups in Iran. But long story short, you have a regime in Tehran that has to make a choice. And I hate to do this because I do it more often than I should, but I want to go back to what Henry Kissinger has said and others. What are you? Are you a revolution model or are you uh, Iran, a country with a set of interests that you seek to uh, secure, for bettering the lives of your people? The Iranian regime has to make that decision because they cannot right now look their people in the eye and say what they're doing in the region, in places like Syria and Iraq and so on, is actually doing much for the basic security needs of their people. Now, everybody in the region is jockeying for power. So Iran is not the only country in the Middle East who is involved in Syria. We know that. But the Iranian regime has had a track record of 40 years of doing that. And I think it's getting to a point where some of the fires that it's helping start in the region might just start coming home. And that's not good for Iran, the nation of Iran. It might be good for some of the diehards in the Revolutionary Guards who live off the idea of constant warfare and 
struggling against so-called imperialism and so forth. But your average Iranian wants to turn a page. Your average Iranian wants to have a job, security for the children, for the family, want to be part of the international community. Iranians are not, by their history, people who wanted to be on the margins of the global scale. This is not North Korea. Iran is part of the world community. That's where it's always been. And the regime just needs to recognize that and has to make that tough decision of changing course. I don't know if Ayatollah Khamenei, while he's still alive, can do that, but he can certainly start the process if he had the wisdom to do it and pass the baton on to somebody who can then build on it, because that's where Iran wants to go, a different direction. If I could just build on something that Alex said, I would remind our own politicians and leaders here in this country, and whether it's this administration or any other, to be very careful about when they issue calls for Iranians to come to the streets or to rebel. Because the way these are being read in Tehran, from what I understand, is to say, you are telling us to rebel so that, one, the country can be split, divided into these ethnic, linguistic, religious enclaves, or you're telling us to rebel so that the Jonestown cult, uh, the Khmer Rouge cult of the MEK, can come back and take power. Well, people in Iran, from what I understand, do not want either of those things. What they are hearing, whatever the intention is, but what they are hearing from our leaders right now is, this is what you should do. On the question of, of U.S. policy in general, um, with people like Bolton, with people like Pompeo, it seems like Iran's a real focus for this administration. How do you see that policy evolving, and what would you uh, suggest should be the priority? It seems to me that the Iranians right now are pursuing a policy of regime change in Washington and simply wait this group out because they see a couple of things. They see a president who is obsessed with discrediting his predecessor. You know, you ask the question, does he care about Iran? Probably not. Not much. Does he know anything about it? No, probably not. But what he knows is that he has this persona of master negotiator and master dealmaker. And he also has this persona of discrediting anything associated with his predecessor. So if his predecessor made an agreement with Iran, it had to be a bad agreement with bad people. And so he's going to do exactly the opposite. The Secretary of State echoed that most recently in his speech in Cairo with a very bizarre sort of trashing of one's predecessor, which in my experience, I was 34 years in the Foreign Service, you never do that in front of a foreign audience. You may do that at a political rally, you may do that internally, but in front of a foreign audience to say, all those things my predecessor did were wrong, they didn't know what they were doing, you demean yourself and you know exactly what's going to happen when you leave. In the case of John Bolton, it's a little different. He has his paymasters from the MEK to please, and clearly that's what he's out to do. Alex, looking ahead, one of the major issues on the horizon for Iran is, and you kind of hinted at this earlier, uh, the issue of succession, of who comes next after the Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei. How do you see that playing out, and who might prevail in that? You know, Alistair, um, when Khomeini came to Iran from his many years in exile in 79, people expected him to die any minute because he was in poor health. He lasted 10 years, but the point was for 10 years, people were trying to get him to help the transition process. Khomeini is in much better health, although he will be 80 this summer. Uh, but people are still trying to whisper in his ear and ask him to start the transition. In other words, they're saying to him, sir, if you start the process while you're still around, it will be manageable. And I cannot think of another issue more sensitive than the issue of U.S.-Iran relations. So I hope that the right people, if they exist anymore in Iran, will say to him, while you're alive, ban the slogan at Friday prayers that says death to America. Ban burning of the American flag. If you really mean, because he's been saying that recently, change course play a different game and help the generation that will come after you by setting this stage, by making it easy, break the taboo, in other words. You can talk to the United States. United States is another country, a powerful country, that can have great impact on where Iran is going in terms of its economics, diplomacy, and so forth on the global stage. You can keep playing this game for another 40 years. I think that could be something very interesting as we look at the succession process, because there are people in Tehran, whether we like it or not, who have turned this anti-Americanism into an industry. You know, they live off this. This is their only claim to fame, if you will, that if we're not here, 
then the Americans will come in and do what they did to Iraq to us. We're the only, I'm talking obviously of the Revolutionary Guards, we're the only vanguards of the nation. How many knows that's not true? How many knows the United States really doesn't have an interest in seeing Iran separated into many different small countries? That doesn't serve U.S. interest. Iran could be a, another Middle Eastern partner for the United States, but there are issues that fundamentally have been a problem for the U.S. going back to 79, the slogans, the actions like the hostage crisis, but the rhetoric as well. Remember, this is a regime that has for 40 years claimed to want to change the global order of things. That is the kind of slogan of 1979 that doesn't resonate anymore. That has to go. And they need to go back and, and decide what is it we want to do. Is it good for Iran to become a client state of China? Is it good that every time you have problems, only the Russians can bail you out? Is that security for Iran? I will tell you it's not. But that's a decision for them to make in Tehran. Well, I would just add that the issue of factional fighting inside Iran over the succession issue is already heating up. We see on the one side the President Rouhani trying to build his own base, even reaching out to some moderate conservatives in an attempt to potentially become just the next supreme leader. And on the other side, we see that the hardliners, the clerics, and the revolutionary guards, they are trying to even consolidate their power more. So there could be different scenarios that could develop after a potential death of supreme leader. There could be a very smooth succession. Another clerk can take over. There could be just protests, and the two camps could just even further amplify their factional fighting with each other. That could destabilize the regime even further. Some people have said that perhaps the Revolutionary Guards would uh, take over and Iran would change from a theocracy to a military dictatorship. It's difficult to predict that, but I personally see a more likely scenario that the Revolutionary Guards would try to still put a weak supreme leader so they can run the show behind the scenes. My record of prediction on Iran is terrible, so I will, I will, will never wait. People, once, somebody once asked me, they said, if you knew so much, why did you go to Tehran in August of 1979, 12 weeks before the embassy was taken? Ali makes an interesting point. Apparently, from what I understand, there's a lot of interest in Iran now looking at the Reza Shah period, the military strongman. And what he did, at the beginning of the revolution, he was anathema. I mean, everything he did, they, they found his old officers, 90 years old, dragged them out and shot them. But... Now there's an interest because looking at what role the military has, he came in as a military leader and became Shah. He didn't have to become Shah. He could have followed Ataturk's model and set up a republic. Someone once said a very good thing about the Islamic Republic. This office of supreme leader is a suit of clothes that fits only one person. And it's very difficult to see anyone stepping into this role who could replicate what Khomeini did. Certainly Khomeini could not. Once you're down to the third iteration, difficult to find. So Ali is right. We may see something of a more militaristic or military model that follows. Yes, absolutely. Like Khomeini has not been Khomeini in terms no. of his decisiveness. Yeah. But at the same time, Khomeini still has managed to keep some kind of balance between different centers of power. So one key question remains that whether the next supreme leader would be able to keep that kind of balance between different centers of power. Each of them has some power, but is not powerful enough to challenge his veto power and supremacy. So I think that that's just a question that remains to be seen. Alex, any final thoughts? I would go with what John said before. It's very tough to predict. I mean, back in 1989, just a few hours before he was announced the next supreme leader of Iran, nobody would have said Ali Khamenei would be the next supreme leader. They literally had to change the constitution to be able to follow in the shoes, big shoes of Khomeini. We don't know what's going to happen. It could be a whole host of things. It could be at the end up with a singular supreme leadership that will have a three or five man council of leaders. That's part of the constitution. It's there. They can go down that path. But fundamentally, I want to go back to the point of what's this regime about? Because it's struggling to be convincing about being an Islamist utopian that delivers the basics of what he promised to do. It is now an adventurist entity that doesn't really know what it is. Is it an Islamic entity? What it is an Islamic entity? How come that its closest allies happen to be the likes of Russia and China and countries in Venezuela and so forth in Latin America? It's all over the map. There is a lack of consistency. They've lost their way. They don't know what they're about. The people of Iran know what they see, though. They see this. The regime is basically, in Farsi, they said they're stealing everything they can get their hands on. And that's the problem.
that it seemed to be a increasingly smaller and smaller elite of people that are looking after number one, both in terms of access to power, but in terms of also filling their pockets. And that just can't go on forever. At some point, it's going to have to give. So to circle back to something that John said earlier, it's complicated and we don't know, but we'll definitely keep watching. We're going to have to leave it there. John, Alex, Ahmed, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. And thank you as well to our audience for listening in and to our production team for their work on today's program. We will see all of you next week. This has been a presentation of the Middle East Institute. To support MEI's programs and podcasts, please donate at www.mei.edu. Thank you for your support.